You know what it says? The very first paragraph of the Universal House of Justice. Here's what it is. Dearly loved friends, the divinely propelled process described in such awe-inspiring words by our beloved guardian, which began 6,000 years ago at the dawn of the Adamic cycle, and which is destined to culminate in the stage at which the light of God's triumphant faith in all its power and glory will have suffused and enveloped the entire planet, is now entering its tenth and last part. Very interesting. The first paragraph of the universe, of the first resolution message, says we're entering the tenth stage. So it's quite clear that the Guardian wanted us to know where we fit in history, and the House of Justice wanted to know where we fit in history, they wanted us to know. They wanted us to see the forest from the trees. And so it's very important when we talk about the five-year plan that we're talking about one tree in a forest that goes, stretches back 6,000 years, and it's going to stretch forth through the Golden Age. We need to understand all of these things. Now, let's look at some of the aspects of the five-year plan. First of all, the five-year plan is part of a process that began in 1996. 1996. How many of you were Baha'is in 1996? Really? That's all? How many have become Baha'is since 1996? Well, that's good. Okay. So, here's the thing. Up until 1996, the way in which the faith grew was we had certain faiths, and we had national assemblies, we had local assemblies, we may have had a few committees like teaching committees and so on. And starting in the 1960s, we began to uh, we began to develop. You know, the councillors were appointed. We had auxiliary board members under the hands of the cause and so on, and we could see that the faith was growing, and some of us were quite happy with that Baha'i faith. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. We're quite happy with that Baha'i faith. But everything that grows continually evolves in complexity. It continually evolves in complexity. And did we think that what we had, you know, during the, the period when we became Baha'i, so the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, that that was everything that was needed to support the structure of world civilization? No, of course not. Things had to grow according to a process. And Shoghi Effendi tried very hard to get us to understand that the faith grows according to a very steady process, just like a tree or a human body or whatever. Everything grows according to a process. <coughs> Shoghi Effendi wanted us to understand this so much that he wrote a book in 1944 called God Passes By, or he, he wrote it, released it in 1944 on the anniversary, so that we could understand <coughs> what the faith is doing. How many of you think God Passes By is a comprehensive history of the Baha'i faith? Who thinks it's a comprehensive history of the Baha'i faith? You would think it is. I would think so. You know it's not? Shogu Khan said it's not a comprehensive history of the Baha'i faith. That will happen later, future historians will do it. He was writing it only for one reason. He says, he says, it is not my purpose, he says. I'll, re I'll read you exactly what he says. He said, it is not my purpose, nor does the occasion demand, to write a detailed history of the last hundred years of the Baha'i faith. He says, all he wants to do, he says, for as we survey the entire range of the operation of a century-old faith, he says, we cannot escape the conclusion that from whatever angle we view this colossal scene, the events associated with these periods present to us unmistakable evidence of a slowly maturing process of an orderly development. In other words, he says he's only writing God passes by so we can realize there's a slowly maturing process, an orderly development. The faith is growing orderly. Let, let, let's just analyze it a little bit. When Shoghi Effendi first became guardian, the will and of Baha said that the faith is to be given to the reins of two institutions, the Universal House of Justice and the guardianship. You, you, you all know this, but this is an otherwise well testimony. So they look at this 24-year-old boy. He was only 24 years old. He only had one year of university. And they say, elect that house of justice quick. OK. And Shoghi Effendi looks in the will and testament of Adabaha, and it says that the universal house of justice has to be elected by there being uh, people in the country electing a body, and that body electing the house of justice. 
Okay, in other words, a house of justice can only come into existence if there's national assemblies. How many national assemblies were there in 1923? Who can tell me? How many? How many? There were three. Okay. So could the House of Justice exist in 1923? No. No. So Shoghi Effendi, just, just like, and Adabaha referred to the House of Justice as the dome of the administrative order. When you want to build a dome, which on top, what do you have to build first? You have to build the pillars. You have to build the, all the pillars to support a dome. But, you know, so Shoghi Effendi said, we need to erect the pillars of the Universal House of Justice. And so he began uh, by getting Baha'is to understand what were national assemblies. So he started this in around 23 because you know he went away in all the whole year of 1922 he was away. In 1923 he started. And by 1936, 13 years later, how many national assemblies did we have? Who can tell me how many national assemblies we had in 36? Who can guess? Just guess. 19. How many? 19. Ni 19? You say 10? We had exactly 10. We had 10 in 1936. So we went from 3 to 10, 7 of them in a 13 year period. So then let's go from 1936 all the way to 1953. Okay, which is what is that, about 27 years ago? Like like um, how many did we have? We had 10 in 36. How many did we have in 1953? Who wants to take a guess? We had 12. <laughs> we got two more. <laughs> we had two more. So then, we have two National Assemblies in 1953. How many did we have in 1963, 10 years later? Just 10 years later, how many did we have? We had 56. 56, from 12 to 50, is that amazing? We, had, we went from 12 to 56. It's just amazing. And so, by ha when we had 56, we could elect the Universal House of Justice because we had the pillars. You can't put a dome on top, you have the pillars. Even when they constructed later on in the 70s and 80s, they constructed the Universal House of Justice building. Have you seen the, the building? It's a building with a dome on top and pillars. You notice that there's pillars? And when they first built the building, the first thing I did is I wanted to photograph from all sides because I wanted to count the pillars. I wanted to see how many pillars. Do you know how many pillars there are on the Universal House of Justice building? 58. <laughs> But, but it's still pretty good, don't you think? It's quite, there are 58 pillars. And I was wondering, why didn't they get it exactly 56? So it would be as simple as it, but I think they didn't need to do that. It was not necessary. But still, it's a potent symbol that the universal house of justice rests on the pillars which are NSAs, which rests on a foundation, which are the believers. And so we had 56 national assemblies in 1963. Ten years later, in 1973, how many did we have? Anyone want to guess? We had 113. That's a greater growth. From 12 to 56 is what? Is that about 40 something? From 56 to 113 is even more. So we even increased more in the next 10 years than we even had done that. Now we had 113 in 1973. In 1979, we had 125. In 1988, we had 148. In 2001, we had 182. In 2008, we had 184. And by this stage, we can stop counting. You know why? Because the United Nations has 192 countries. Okay, so pretty much we're, we're, we're pretty much getting to the end. And so we have to start counting other things. We can't even count the growth. We can't see the growth anymore in national assemblies. And Shoghi Effendi started counting other things too. He started counting. LSAs. He started counting languages. He started. He loved to count everything, and he would count them, and he would show the Baha'is, look how much we could. And so we realized that the faith is growing according to a very systematic plan. But look at what the Baha'is had to do in every stage of that growth to now, and it wasn't the same thing. It wasn't the same thing. In a certain stage, they may have had to have given their lives. The dawnbreakers may have to give their lives. In other stages, they may have had to go travel teaching throughout the world. In other stages, they may have to have raised up local assemblies. In other stages, they may have to build national assemblies. In other words, there are different things that had to be done at every stage. None of us could do what we can do today without them doing those stages. In the same way that we can't put a roof on a house unless somebody else built the 
you know, the foundation of the walls. And so let's come down to this plan we have now. Let's zoom in now. Uh, let's come to the year 1996. 1996, which how many years ago was 1996? 17. 17. Yeah, about 17 years ago, right? Okay. So, or 18, how many years? 96 to 13, how far is that? 17 years, okay. So 17 years ago, the House of Justice announced that we were going to have a new plan, a new kind of plan. We'd had many plans. So how many of you remember the nine-year plan, and the five-year, the other five-year plan? Yeah. So we've had many plans that the House of Justice had launched. But in 1996, they, they launched a plan, and they said something that seemed rather surprising. They said this, this plan, this first plan in 1996 they're launching, acquires a special place in the scheme of Baha'i and world history. Okay, now we'll say, come on, how's the justice? This plan, Shoghi Fendi said the Tenure Crusade, you know, it was one whole part of the vast majestic process, you know, with one, one state. And now the House Justice is launching a plan in 1996, they say, acquires a special place, not just in Baha'i history, but in world history. Something they were starting to do in 1996, they say, was a turning point in the history of humanity. And they say, those of us who are alive to the vision of the faith are particularly privileged to be consciously engaged in the efforts intended to stimulate and eventually enhance such processes. So somehow they say that we're beginning something that has never been done in the history of the human race. We're beginning in 1996, and we are privileged to be alive to carry it out. And so they described the goal of this first plan, of this first four-year plan that came in 1996, as the goal was to advance the process of entry by troops. That's what they said. Now we were all like, whoo, what does that mean? How many of you remember first hearing that, advance the process of entry by troops? It's an interesting concept. Because we had read way back in the 1950s, Shoghi Effendi described that the faith would go through three stages in its growth. It would go through three stages. He said the first stage was a steady flow of new believers. A steady flow of new believers would grow that way. And then it said it would give way to what he called the stage of entry by troops. Entry by troops. And he said that would give way to a third stage, which he said was mass conversion. And he said the mass conversion would reinforce a thousandfold the numerical strength as well as the material and spiritual power of the faith of Baha'u'llah. A thousandfold increase. If there are six million Baha'is today, a thousandfold, how many Baha'is would there be? Six billion. Six billion, right? You got three zeros, you got six billion. So if we had a thousandfold increase, pretty much the whole world would be there. Okay. But you can't get to that stage of the thousandfold increase until you go through the stage of entry by troops. Now, nobody really knew when the stage of entry by troops would happen. We didn't know when it would come, we wouldn't know what it would be like, and a lot of us thought that the stage of entry by troops was something that would just happen to us one day. You know, you just go over, you know, one day there'd be a knock on the door and the troops <laughs> <laughs> just, Isn't that right? We, all, we thought that that stage, because we knew the word entry by troops, but we just thought they're going to come. You're walking down the street, hey, there's the troops, you know, come on. So we did, and the House of Justice tried to explain to us in 1996 and the years after that entry by troops was a process, not an event. <clears throat> the difference between a process and an event. And we should have known this because all things grow according to process. Events. Uh, trees grow, plants grow, animals, everything grows as a process. It's a slow and a steady process. But you only realize the process by surveying it. That's why Shoghi Effendi wanted to survey all the past so we could look at it and say, oh, now we see the process. If you go out and look at a tree today, you don't see it growing. If you go tomorrow and you say, what a stupid tree, it hasn't grown at all. You, you, okay. But if you look at it from a wider process, you realize, oh my gosh, that tree has, has done very well. And the House of Justice says, entry by troops is a process. And it's a process that we can nurture and advance. And they said it's very important to understand that we say advance the process of entry by troops so that we understand that it is not something that will just happen once, okay? It is something that will gradually happen. So first of all, it's a process, 
not an event. Second, we're advancing it. Also, they said, we use advance because we don't want to give you the impression that it hasn't already begun. If we had said, begin the process of entry by truth, or initiate the process of entry by truth, then you would have thought it never happened, and now we're beginning it. By using the word advance, they say it's a process that's already going on, but it's infinitesimal, and we have to push it. We have to advance it. So in order to advance it, we have to do certain things that we have never done in the history of the faith, and never done in the history of humanity. And so, in 2000, after the <coughs> end of that first four years, in which they introduced the concept of the uh, uh, institute process and the study circle, and many other concepts that we're going to talk about, they said that the next four years, and I'm quoting it, will represent an extraordinary period in the history of the faith, a turning point of epochal magnitude. What does epochal mean? What does epoch mean? An epoch is a whole new phase in human history. And Shoghi Fendi said that you can divide the, the ages of the faith into epochs. And the formative age in 1921, it began with one epoch and another epoch. And the House of Justice said in 2000 that because we began this new process of entry by troops, advancing the president, we turned into a new epoch. And so they announced that, that there was a new epoch. And now today we live in the fifth epoch. How many of you know that you live in the fifth epoch? You should just walk down the street and say, I'm living in the fifth epoch. <laughs> okay, because it's a great turning point. And by 2010, which was 10 years later, the House of Justice described what we had done from the beginning of the fifth epoch to now, you know, what we call the, the, all the core activities and everything. And they say, the system thus created to develop its human resources in this system thus created, the community of the greatest name possesses an instrument of limitless potentialities. So what is an instrument, what does limitless mean? It means that it, is, it has no limits. Okay. If you, if someone say, here's an instrument and it can do anything, if I said, here is it, like, like in Star Wars, they had a, like a saber or something, or, or in uh, Lord of the Rings, they had that little thing, that, you know, the little talisman ring, is that right? If someone said, here is something that has unlimited potentiality, it's an instrument, how would you feel about it? Would you want to have it? Yeah. The House of Justice says that the system that we are building now, it has limitless potentialities. Somehow we've built it. Now, if we decide not to take this system and find its unlimited potentiality, then it's our loss. It's our loss. But the key word is potentiality. Potentiality is a very key word, because if I look at a little baby right now, say I look at a little baby, um, do I look at what it can do right now, or do I see what it's going to grow into? Is that right? In 15 or 20 years. In fact, the baby is pretty stupid. I mean, it can be do very good. No, I'm serious. You, you laugh at it. What can the baby do? Okay? It doesn't, it can't even go to the bathroom. You have to clean it. It's, it's not, I don't want to go there. The baby is not very good. But we know its potentiality. So we nurture it. We care for it. We don't think, how oh, what a stupid baby. I'm going to go and work with somebody older and leave the baby. No. We know that we have given birth to something of great potentiality. And so the, the key here is the potentiality, because I know some Baha'is, in 1996, they said, oh, I, I went to one study circle, where are the troops? You know, where are all the troops? <laughs> I went to two study circles, and the troops still didn't come. Okay, the House of Justice said it's a process. It's a process that has limitless potentialities, but we have to have a broader view in the same way that you have a broader view to the baby. So now, when we come back after the break, we're going to get into the details of this system of limitless potential that the House of Justice has created that's part of a vast majestic process of 6,000 years that we are privileged to take part in. So we'll see you after the break. Thank you. So, dear friends, we will have a 15 minutes break.